What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Well Man's Podcast. My name is Brian Brosey. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Keone Tita. Keone, how are you today? Doing wonderful. Today, Brian, we're going to be talking about gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's otherwise known as um, GERD or um, acid reflux, or some people have called it um, agita. Um, it's just that burning sensation that people tend to get um, usually after eating. But really what it is, is, you know, a really stomach acid being in a place that it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And for, for most people, it's that stomach acid being back, you know, kind of backwashing up into the esophagus. So you get this burning sensation kind of like underneath your sternum. And sometimes that backwash can go way up into your into your mouth, and it's a big, big issue now. I, I think you know we're talking about the United States people in the U.S. spending millions of dollars on trying to treat symptoms of this. So you've probably seen a lot of people using things like uh, you know proton pump inhibitors or acid blocking medications. You can get these over the counter relatively easily. Um, and we'll be taking these things every day. And then right. you have to ask yourself, well, if you're doing this all the time, and we know that stomach acid plays a role in people's health, and you're constantly blocking it, is that really the right way to treat it? Mm. So what does stomach acid do, you know, besides help break down food? And it actually does a lot a lot of stuff that keeps you healthy so it's it's really part of the immune system right so think about it if you if you're if you don't have a stomach acid around and you're eating food and food is usually you know has bugs in it so to speak like bacteria possibly parasites uh viruses this acid will break them down and kill them you're talking about a ph in the stomach of you know one to two yeah, that's, that's highly, highly acidic. And, and if that acid is not, if it doesn't stay in the stomach, what does it do to areas like the esophagus where acid shouldn't be? Right. And you're talking about it being highly ero erosive. And that leads to all kinds of problems. Uh, probably the worst being that it can lead to cancer of the esophagus. But getting back to what we were talking about, what else does it do? Well, stomach acid is needed to help you absorb B vitamins, especially B12. Um, it enhances absorption of all minerals and vitamins. Um, it, it tells things, you know, tell, it, it actually directs function of lower GI stuff, right? So it helps the pancreas do what it needs to do. It helps the bile, the gallbladder, and liver, you know, to do what they need to do. It, it initiates peristalsis, the movement of food through the stomach and the stomach, you know, contracting to help it move along. So motility, um, it, it helps with hunger, right? If you have appropriate acid secretion, um, you're, you're going to be less likely to uh, overeat or um, undereat. Um, and then the other thing it does, and we've talked about this a lot on the podcast, is it helps to optimize gut flora. Right, so if you don't have stomach acid there, you may be causing other gut bugs to grow or be inhibited, which can cause all kinds of problems. Um, one of them being a, a, a bug called Clostridium, which is a which is a big deal, which can cause you know just uh, diarrhea and can be life threatening in some people, um, especially in the older population. So indirectly helps prevent fat gain. And um, the other thing it does is indirectly helps prevent bone fractures. So if you're constantly on these meds and you're not absorbing minerals like calcium or magnesium, what does that do over time to, to your bones, right? Yeah. And, and of course, you know, with, with acid, you know, it, it appropriately, it helps monitor or keep the pH in an optimal range not only in the stomach, but throughout the digestive tract. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, it does, it, it does a lot. And a lot of people don't think about this when they're, when they're popping their, you know, acid blocking medications. Right. So there's a, there's a beneficial role for it. Um, you know, and it, it, it's connected to almost every, every part of the body. Yeah, absolutely. And cause it's so acidic, like you mentioned, that immunity is, is huge. 
Right, right. So what's the issue? I mean, a lot of times it's, you know, think about, we have something called the lower esophageal sphincter or LES. And that is like a little band of muscle that sits at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach. And if that LES isn't doing its function, is, isn't operating uh, appropriately, whereas it's, you know, when you eat, it doesn't shut down or contract to keep the acid from splashing up, then, then that's a problem. You know, as you're digesting food, acid's going to splash up into your esophagus. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things in the lifestyle, in your lifestyle, that can affect that. One being, right, so we talked about weight gain. If you have a lot of weight gain, especially in the abdominal area, right, so think about visceral fat that's fat around your, your organs and liver, you know, um, in, your, in your abdomen. You know, think about the beer belly type thing. That's a lot of visceral fat. Well, that exerts an upward pressure, right? So, so your esophageal sphincter may be trying to work as best as it can, but if you're constantly putting pressure on it, upward with the, the fat that is accumulated in the stomach, that esophageal sphincter can't hold back the acid. And a lot of times it will force it up. Yeah. So it's like right. a mechanical way that it can be caused. Right. Right. I mean, you can think about like, it's like weightlifting. Eventually mm -hmm. those muscles are going to fatigue that can't control the, the pressure, the upward pressure. So it's one way. So, so we know that losing weight or losing that visceral fat can significantly help. And, and for some people, that's really all they have to do is just make sure that they're, you know, that they drop weight. That's yeah, and, and studying this and tr treating people at this county, have you ever seen anyone um, like, is there, a, can this be caused via something systemic or something more, I don't know, serious or not mechanical? like uh like the fat or laying down after you're eating or something like that like are oh, there yeah okay of course there's okay so, so there's there's plenty of conditions that can increase your risk of this okay i talked about one obesity especially that that fat or in the abdomen um another big one which you probably heard of is a hiatal hernia and, mm -hmm. and basically what that is is a hernia or um basically a hernia is where you get get like um or organs like pooching through mu muscle, so to speak. And the muscle that the stomach is, is, is pushing, pushing through would be the diaphragm. That's a hiatal hernia. So think about that. If you have uh, your stomach, that's kind of part of it is pooching up through the mm -hmm. diaphragm, you have very little space to, for the stomach to do its di uh, digestion below the diaphragm, right? Yeah. And so that can exert pressure up on that lower esophageal sphincter and okay. um so so how you know how would you how treat that how would you take care of that if you have a high odor hernia well it's really interesting Some, sometimes it's very very simple um you know as far as lifestyle stuff goes one thing to do is to make sure that you're you know with GERD is make sure you're chewing your food thoroughly and and slowly and you're kind of in that rest digest phase so you're not constantly on the go you know eating in your car or whatever where you sit down and eat and and kind of enjoy the food um another another thing that specifically treats the hiatal hernia that can be helpful is sometimes we'll have people like put some weight in their stomach and the way you do this you can see there's youtube videos out there is you to drink a you know a big glass of water um that will fill up the stomach and do like heel drops to like kind of pull pull the stomach out of the diaphragm. And then there's also massage therapists can actually do what's called something called visceral manipulation that can pull the stomach down out of the diaphragm. So mm -hmm. for some people that, that can help. So think about other conditions that can exert upward pressure on the LES. Well, of course, pregnancy, right? I mean, a woman carrying a baby, you know, that's taking a lot of space below the diaphragm. It exerts an upward pressure and, and then can cause that lower esophageal sphincter to open up there are connective tissue disorders like scleroderma so something more uh, systemic that can also cause that you know where the the tissue is compromised there from more of a um, systemic disorder and uh, a lot of times you can also have what's called you know delayed stomach empty and a lot of times that can be easily resolved by making sure that you're eating slowly and not eating too fast you know, there's, there's other factors that can aggravate it too. So 
course, eating large meals, eating late at night, and then laying down. So you're talking about, you know, some people have to sit up to, uh, or sleep sitting up so they don't get this reflux back up into their esophagus. And then there's also certain foods. I mean, you know, when people have GERD, a lot of people are really, they know the foods that aggravate it. A lot of them tend to be like fatty and fried foods. Sometimes um, uh, spicy foods certainly can do it too. And there are certain things like alcohol that are known to relax that lower esophageal sphincter. So alcohol can do it and coffee may do it also. And then there's certain medications and one of them is, is aspirin. Aspirin may even, even be a risk factor for, for GERD. So when I, hear, when I hear, you know, like when people ask me what is reflux or GERD, you know, it's really, a, it's really acid being in a place that it shouldn't be. And that's, that's in the, the esophagus. And so it's a big, it's a, it's a big deal if, if this is ongoing, right? Because mm-hmm. you are, think about the erosive nature of a low pH, the acidic nature. I mean, you know, you don't have the mucosal lining in the esophagus that there is in the stomach that protects you from this high acid environment. So therefore the tissue gets highly, highly irritated and over time can cause something like what's called Barrett's esophagus, which is like a pre, pre-cancerous condition of the esophagus. So this is why your doctors, you know, if you're constantly having this, they, they want you to be on these um, acid blockers and, you know, you kind of weigh in the advantages and the disadvantages of being on them, you know, like, so your conventional doctor is trying to do the right thing to prevent the, uh, a worse condition like cancer. Um, however, the, you also have to know as a consumer of these medications that you're increasing your risk of all kinds of problems if you, complete, if you treat this completely with just these acid blockers. And so what do those drugs do exactly? I mean, I can kind of infer from the name, but I have no idea how they so, uh, so when I, Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, when I, when I say uh, acid blockers, it's kind of a catch-all phrase for some of these drugs, but a lot of these drugs are are you know you can you can kind of group them mainly into three three types of categories right one of them would be antacids all right so most people have heard of that so these are things that you typically can get over the counter and antacids are things like mylanta or rolades or tums um, and they can provide quick release most people can help manage their their symptoms with these things. Um, basically, what it does is you're you're neutralizing the stomach acid, right? So, how do you neutralize stomach acid? You put something in there that tends to be basic, right? And so that would be like minerals, like calcium. Tums is mostly calcium, so that neutralizes stomach acid. Same with Rolaids and Mylanta. Um, you, you may even be able to uh, help it with another, uh, you know pH raising uh, mineral. Magnesium can also help with that, but usually Tums and Rolates. The other group of medications are, are known as what we call H2 receptor blockers. Um, H, H, the H and H2 stands for histamine. Um, you know, uh, um, histamine, if, if you don't block these receptors, histamine helps, is, is a compound or a chemical that helps uh, produce acid in the stomach without getting into too much detail. But anyway, so you want to take medications that block this histamine production so that you don't make a lot of stomach acid, right? Okay. So these things include, uh, what would it be? Um, uh, Pepsid, Tagamet, um, Zantac. These are the, uh, you've heard of these meds. Um, they don't work as quickly as, as antacids, but they, they provide a lot longer uh, relief from the, you know, the reflux. So, okay. So there's essentially two ways, making it less or more basic, less acidic, mm-hmm. and then blocking the acid production, which would be the right. H2 receptor ones. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Can, we, can you tilt your microphone up towards you uh, so the blue, like the little blue emblem that we have on the microphone is facing us? Yeah, the blue emblem. Yeah, it says blue. It's not blue. It says blue. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I got it. I got it. All right, cool. Is that better? That's better. Yeah, that's better. All right. You're kind of cutting it out. Sorry. We're so we're, oh, no, we heard no, you. No, it's good. Keep me on track here with the um, with 
I'm going to make a device that holds make, it like a make, cervical make, collar right in front of your, <laughs> in front of your head. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so where were we? So we, we gave, so we talked about antacids H, yep. and we talked about H2 blockers. And then there's that other uh, medications called proton pump inhibitors. Basically the, in the body, a proton pump uh, in the stomach, the cells that, would be classified or mechanisms within cells classified as proton pumps um, help make acid again. And so these, these proton pump inhibitors inhibit that. And these things are like Prilosec or what's another one? Uh, Prilosec I've heard of. Yeah. Prilosec, uh, Prevacid, Prevacid. Um, uh, Prilosec is a, a Miprazole. Anyway, there, there's a, there's a number of them um, out there. Let's see. And oh, here's a, another one is Nexium. Yeah. Okay. That's the, that's the main one. And you look at when you read the, you know, warnings and side effects of these medications, there's a couple things that come about, right? So, so you may see that uh, one of the side effects or things will say, well, this can increase your risk of vitamin B12 deficiency or end or bone fractures. So think about how many older individuals, right? who already have osteopenia or osteoporosis, low bone density, and they're also taking these acid blockers, right? Mm. That's a, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a problem. That's another stress on the body that can make their risk of fracture a lot worse. And then the other thing about this is most of these meds, when you read the label there, it will say, you know, uh, especially the over-the-counter meds, I mean, this is just over-the-counter, don't take longer than 14 days. And then you have to think, well, wow, I mean, how many people take these acid blocking medications day in and day out and at every single meal? Yeah. That's yeah, I know plenty of people who are just popping Tums like they're right. the mints right. that come with dinner. And, and not only Tums, but then even some of the more, uh, mm -hmm. the prescription grade ones too, right? right. Just every day. And um, so that's a, that's a big problem. And it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, as far as, you know, what are the long-term side effects? Well, one, one of them is, you know, major one is their increased risk of a fracture and then digestive, all kinds of digestive complaints, which can be a big, big problem. So you really have to make sure that you're, you're treating, you're, you're going about it foundationally the lifestyle stuff that is going to, that is going to help you come off of these medications. That should be, that should be the goal. And if you're, con if you're reliant on these medications, I mean, I recommend all my patients to, to really go, go see their physician, but also, you know, to, to talk to more integrative docs, you know, uh, listen to podcasts like these to see what else they, they can do to help themselves. Yeah. Cause most of the time, as you know, we talked about this a lot is, when you go to your physician, all they're going to do is just, they're going to say, oh, okay, well, you have this. Here's your, here's your med for this. Right. right. Yeah. Um, there are, so, let, so we talked about medications, all right? And for, for most people, uh, that will take care of the problem, all right? By, mm. Or at least take care of the, the, manage the symptoms, not take care of the problem, but manage the symptoms. The lifestyle stuff is actually going to get to the root of the problem most of the time but not always, but most of the time. And if you can do both, usually I would say 90% of the people can, can get off of their, their acid blocking medications. Uh, is, there something, are, yeah, go ahead. is there something you as a naturopath, Keone, suggest someone who's on these acid blocker medications do as well? I will say they're going to take the medication. Yep. Yeah. Are, are you saying take this with it or? Yeah, I, I will basically, and I will tell them to, you know, if, if you're getting a lot of pain and you definitely need this medication, what we want to do is the goal should be to come off of it. And I always say this, if and when we can, usually you can, if you come off of it slowly, you certainly don't want to come off these medications quickly. Um, and you certainly don't want to come off those medications without a plan. The plan being is getting the lifestyle stuff in order. We already talked about a few of those, right? So one lifestyle change could be, well, if we know alcohol and you're a drinker and you like your alcohol every day, we know alcohol relaxes that LES. And if you relax that LES, you're going to be more likely to get GERD. So there's little things like that. If you smoke, we know that that's going to cause a problem. We also know if you have to be reliant on these acid blocking medications, well, what's one very simple thing to do to mitigate 
the possible negative side effects of uh, increase in wrist fracture or or become an anemic because you're not making enough you're not getting the b12 that you need that would be take a good high potency multivitamin every time you know throughout the you know once a day or whatever it's recommended on that multivitamin you're taking but it should be high potency high b vitamins and have minerals in there and just doing that that can mitigate the risk of hip fractures right because you're you're resupplementing that stuff that that stuff and in the meantime you're you're working to come off those medications if and when yeah. you and hopefully working out and work well working out's Obviously. a big uh, <laughs> working out's a big thing for a couple of reasons right so so exercise we know exercise can help with um you know keeping you from gaining weight we also know that it lowers stress too it's a great way to lower stress stress is a big deal right so if you are constantly under stress um, chronic stress, what happens? You're, you're kind of in that chronic fight or flight. And if you're in chronic fight or flight, you're not going to digest well. And I'll put this very simply to you. So for example, let's say you're starving, you're really hungry, but all of a sudden a lion jumps out at you. You're not going to feel hungry anymore. <laughs> you know? In fact, you're not going to sit down to it, want to sit down to a meal. You're going to run away. Your, your digestive tract is going to completely shut down. Well, on another level, your digestive tract will shut down when you're on under chronic stress too, and mm -hmm. it doesn't work as well. So yeah. that's why you really want to think about rest and digest, eating slowly, you know, sitting down to eat instead of eating on the go all the time. I mean, a lot of Americans eat in their cars or, you know. I keep shitting on this eating on the go, and I haven't told them yet that every breakfast uh -huh. for the last year and a half, Kenny, I've had to eat on the go. <laughs> the, life, the, life, the life of student and and i you know it's funny i think i told you this before i had when i was in medical school i had a friend who stopped at a burger joint uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> he got these these burgers wrapped in paper or whatever and he got to the clinic and he ate his burgers he realized he ate his burgers with the wrapper wow. so he ate the whole thing without <laughs> that's i've never I, actually eaten the wrapper but i've bitten the tin, <laughs> some tin foil before like yeah like this that. was like paper wrapper that he ate and ate everything so <laughs> without realizing what he's doing. Anyway, getting back to like some of the conventional treatments, there are medications that will don't just block acid, but may help to strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter. One of these medications is called baclofen and it, and it kind of, uh, uh, helps, helps keep the uh, lower esophageal sphincter from, uh, fatiguing itself, so to speak. Is that so, what baclofen's for? Is no, I think no. Reason? Yeah. No, their baclofen is, if I'm not mistaken, it's for, uh, I think it's a, it's a, I think it's an antibiotic, isn't it? Baclofen. Uh, oh, no, no, no. It's, a, I'm sorry. No, it's not an antibiotic. It's a muscle. It's a muscle relaxer. Muscle spasticity. Okay. Yeah. That makes yeah. Sense. For muscle spasticity. Yes, 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 yes. So it's kind of interesting how, how it will, will act on the lower esophageal sphincter. It must that have. That makes sense. Yeah. It, it, well, it, yeah, it must, it must, uh, keep the spasms from, from keeping them from doing this rhythmic contraction and relaxation thing where you can get an exacerbation of, of acid reflux. But yeah, that's, that's the way it works. So it's a muscle, muscle relaxer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, that's another one that can, can help. And then there's all, there's also, so if none of those work, you got the, you got surgical procedures that, that can, can help. I mean, one, one of them is called, a, I can't even pronounce these names, a fundoplication. Um, this is where the surgeon will wrap like the top of the stomach around the lower esophageal sphincter to tighten the muscles, which will, to tighten it. It's almost like tying a knot around the LES to prevent reflux. Uh, you know, it's not one of these things you want to do. Hmm. Um, there's also something called a Lynx device, L-I-N-X. This is an interesting one because basically what it is, is it's a little tiny ring of magnetic beads that's, that's wrapped around the, the, the LES, that junction at stomach and esophagus. And, mm -hmm. and these magnetic beads, you know, uh, keep it shut. Like they, they magnetize the, and attract to one another. And you have to have a lot of pressure in the stomach for there to be any reflux then. So that's the way that works. So it's all, it's basically uh, mechanical. Wow. Do you know if you control the, like when it's magnetizing or not, or is it you always tight or? Yeah, I think it's always, I think it's always tight. I don't think you have any control over that. So yeah, it's, it's, 
kind of interesting. Have uh, you ever seen anyone with these? Uh, I, I haven't seen. I here? haven't seen any. I haven't seen anyone with these. Usually, I uh, I've seen all the you know the people right before you have to get to uh, surgery. So I haven't seen. I think I I haven't seen. Um, I think I've seen the the fun duplication one. I haven't seen the links to links device. But so anyway, these are, these are things that are really things you want you you can think about like if if you've tried everything and nothing is really helping. Yeah. So typically, for those people that are going to get that surgery, what or a device or surgery, at what point does it do you say, okay, I need to have this surgery? Because to me, so far, so many things are adding up. Lifestyle. You could address this, you can address this, you can address this and hope that it changes um, and hope that it helps. It seems like the majority of it is caused from lifestyle related, related things. It, so, it, cer it certainly is, right? It, mm -hmm. it certainly is lifestyle stuff is it's over time that that causes this. For example, I mean, no, you know, um, most people, 99% of people are not born with you know just a lower Over reactive LES, LES. Yeah. yeah one that just does not work you mm -hmm. know um th there are some exces exceptions to that but you know for most people it's it's lifestyle stuff and i think the, to get to your question i think the you know when is it time to really consider surgery well if you've certainly tried everything but also you know if you actually if, if you have a diagnosis of a precancerous condition due to acid being in the esophagus, like Barrett's esophagus and stuff, and, and you've tried everything and you tried it with the meds, then at some point, you know, we, you may want to, may want to consider that because we, you know, you're on the verge of getting, you know, kind of cancer, or if you've already had a diagnosis of it and you don't want to exacerbate it, that may, that may be the, be a part of the treatment of it yeah. so okay so, so so we talk about lifestyle stuff we've talked about quit smoking you you brought up like uh exercising regularly um well, a real simple thing is correct posture right we know yeah. that sitting sitting for a long time exacerbates that sitting sitting with poor posture exacerbates it even worse think about the upward pressure that that can put on the stomach and the esophagus so uh, eating small meals throughout the day. That's a big one. Chewing your food very, very slowly. Um, thinking about your heartburn triggers. We already mentioned some spicy foods. For some people, it can be uh, chocolate. It can be anything with caffeine in it. Um, a lot of people know their food triggers and you, sh you should try to avoid them. Uh, what a, a very common sense way to help prevent this is wear loose fitting, fitting clothes, right? So if you're mm wearing like excessively tight pants that you know are constricting you or putting upward pressure on your diaphragm and stomach then yeah that's going to exacerbate acid reflux and then um you know some things to symptom management would be to sleep with your head and shoulders propped up at night um and then that goes to the thing maybe don't eat so close to bed right so give yourself at least three to four hours before bedtime without eating yeah all those the postural ones and stuff that really sticks out to me because that's you know what i've learned in school so far and how i've interacted with gerd so far right um, but it is it, it makes sense you know if, if you go eat why would you if the tube or the hole that you're having this problem from up at the top with the esophagus and the les is up at the top why would you lay that on its side and then make it on on the side so that, right. that makes sense for the posture staying upright um, I like what you said about sitting because being too hunched over or having bad posture can definitely increase that po uh, that pressure in your belly and send the stuff north in your right. body towards your head. So, yeah, it, it's a, it's amazing what prolonged sitting does to your health. I mean, it's yeah. kind of crazy, um, and that's a very simple thing to to really think about. Yeah, and maintaining that correct posture while you're doing it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And and one of the best things that helps maintain correct posture is just exercise can really help with that. So, uh, what else? So, so if we know some of the, the, you know, conventional treatments, we can kind of think about some of the natural stuff. We already talked about some of the lifestyle stuff, but if, if you have a high acid environment and you're just trying to neutralize, well, there's some very simple things that can help with that. One of them being baking soda, right? Baking soda, sodium mm -hmm. bicarbonate, um, and that will will neutralize acid. So, um, 
you know, so what, you're, what you're talking about here is the natural tums pretty much with that, that immediate, you just finished eating some baking soda type thing. If you're having these immediate symptoms. Yeah, it's, work. yeah, it works like Tums, but it's uh, unlike Tums, it's not calcium carbonate. This is sodium bicarbonate, it's baking soda. And yes, it's neutralizing the acid. So it's like the natural form of, of Tums. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, now the, so that's one way to, to help it. And, but you know, there, there are that, that's real to me, it's a short term solution, right? You're just, it's a symptom management way, but that's mm -hmm. a natural way to, uh, to help another, another thing. This is really interesting. And I, I, again, when we, we define what GERD is really, I like uh, the definition of it is, I think is, you know, acid being in a place that it shouldn't be like the esophagus, right? Yeah. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is because in theory out there, there, there is, uh, you know, this theory that it's not really due to high stomach acid, right? A lot of people say, oh, I produce too much stomach acid. Well, that's not really correct in saying that. Really, what's probably happening is you have a, a lower esophageal sphincter that just can't do the work that it needs to do to keep acid where it should be. And one of the things, and this is kind of counterintuitive, and you'll hear this a lot, is apple cider vinegar. And we know vinegar is, is acidic. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but taking small amounts of asp apple cider vinegar, maybe diluted in water, uh, seems to affect that LES and tighten it up. And it may be that the LES gets a taste of acid, so to speak, with this apple cider vinegar and then makes it, makes it uh, tighter over time by, by using apple cider vinegar. The other thing that apple cider vinegar does, especially if you use the natural forms of it, like uh, Bragg's apple cider vinegar, you get uh, some probiotics in there. And one way to help treat naturally uh, any digestive complaint, including uh, GERD or reflux, is to make sure that you get probiotics in there. But apple cider vinegar um, can, can help. Uh, and what we find out, one of the ways to diagnose uh, GERD or reflux besides just saying, oh, well, you know, I have a burning in my, underneath my sternum is to actually send the, put a pH probe into your stomach. This, uh, you can, this is called like a, I think one of the names like a Heidelberg test and you can assess what the pH is there. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what docs find usually is your pH should be around one, one to two um, in your stomach. But sometimes people don't have a, enough stomach acid so sometimes and and, and have a, a relaxed uh, les so it, even if you have a, a ph of four or five there and it's and it's coming up into your esophagus it's still a problem and then maybe some of these acidic things like apple cider vinegar can really help with that it can help help your body uh produce or you know make more stomach acid if you will. So the apple cider vinegar can help in two ways from what you're saying. One is it can kind of, it can help you digest and it can help strengthen that lower esophageal sphincter. Okay. Yeah. So those are some things to think about. And I've had patients over the years use this stuff and, and swear by, I still go to the place that, you know, again, it's symptom management. So it's like, are right. we getting to the root cause by just using bacon soda or, or apple cider vinegar? And you know, I, it's one of those things like I, this treatment still needs to be, we need to go to the foundational treatment, which usually tends to be uh, lifestyle stuff. Right. Um, so what is, so there are some other things that we can also, we can also do. So one of the things that you can do to treat naturally is how can we um, kind of get, get food out of the stomach faster, right? So one way to do it is not to eat too much. And maybe another thing naturally that helps the stomach uh, get food out faster, and this is kind of counterintuitive too in a way, is to take a digestive enzyme. So if you're taking a digestive enzyme with your food, well, you're helping your digestive tract digest it. So, so if it's already digested, the stomach doesn't have to work so far, therefore it leaves the stomach faster. So that's why a digestive enzyme may help. Hmm. I tell people that try to take a digestive enzyme especially if you're dealing with reflux or GERD that, that doesn't have betaine HCL in it because then you're adding more stomach acid there, right? right? Yeah. So that, may be a, that may be problematic. May not be for some people because sometimes having a little bit of acid like the apple cider vinegar 
Apple cider vinegar can help to help food leave the stomach faster too. Um, it may help by having a little bit of acid, but I always, I'll start off with enzymes that don't have the acid in it. The mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, certainly going for a walk right after you eat, preferably well, yeah. a bumpy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could help with the hiatal hernia. You're right. It certainly <laughs> can help with that too. <laughs> you eat something and you pull the stomach out of the uh, diaphragm, so to speak. But walk, walking can can help, definitely. It will certainly help with the motility of your GI it, it, system. It certainly will, yeah. Exercise, there's very few instances where exercise does not help your condition of whatever whatever it may be. We talked about uh, probiotic. Some of it found it in, you know, a good, a good apple cider vinegar like Bragg's, but taking a good high-quality probiotic can certainly help. Um, it will add to the protection of the esophagus and the stomach. Um, and then what else? Oh, and then another way to treat naturally is just to use natural compounds that help build up the mucosa in both the esophagus mm -hmm. and the stomach or coat it in such a way that the excess or the acid being there does not cause a problem. These things are like deglycerinated licorice, all right? That's one natural compound that can help. Usually the way you do this is you chew that, chew uh, DGL, uh, after meals and mix it up real good with your saliva and that will coat the esophagus. Therefore, you're protecting the mucosa. Zinc carnosine is another thing, another supplement. These compounds can also um, help build up the mucosa. And there's, what are the other ones? Like D-lemonine is, is another natural compound that can, that can help. So, so you're trying to, through lifestyle, you're trying to, um, you know, don't do anything that aggravates it. And then you're also trying to help the stomach contents leave faster. And then you're also making sure that the gut bug populations are appropriate through taking a good uh, probiotic to where that's not exacerbating it. And then you're protecting the esophagus and mucosa, not only with the probiotics, but those other compounds that we mentioned. Those would be ways to help you wean off your acid blocking medication. Great. Yeah. And, and then we mentioned, oh, and then there's another, so there's another symptom management thing that a lot of people haven't even realized that's out there. And I use it a lot in my clinic is using, you know, what do we call the, uh, a raft forming and raft like a boat raft forming alginate supplement. Alginate is like a seaweed act extract. And what it does is you take it after a meal, mix it with saliva really good and what it will do is form like a cap over the stomach contents, like a gel cap, which is a seaweed-based thing. And as you digest, that cap kind of keeps the stomach contents from splashing up into the esophagus. And then you just digest your food and, and that cap. So the alginate supplements are another way to do it, which can keep stress off the esophagus, which can help you wean off of these acid-blocking medications also. That's so interesting. Those, so that's something you would take after you eat and it would, that's, it would yep. lay that cap, so to say? Uh-huh. That's okay, exactly wow. what it is. It's like a, a, like a roof, putting a roof on top of the stomach contents with these alginate supplements. And they're, they're basically made from seaweed extracts that you can... That's super interesting. Yeah, I love this because so far at this podcast, it's like baclofen, things like this. These are all things I've come across in school. But right. I'm like, you know, I, like I remember having baclofen come across you know, my eyes a few times and I couldn't remember what it was right there. And then the right. alginate, those are used as like uh, wound dressings when they're very, very uh, high exudate, when they're draining a lot, when the wound oh, is like super liquidy. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> I just hear, I hear little things that you say and I'm like, oh, alginate. Da, 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 and oh, I that's it. See, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Wow. So okay. then it's interesting that it's used in that highly, obviously highly, uh, wet environment of the inside stomach and that lays that cap down and it just it's it, mm -hmm. it makes sense from both those uses it's just interesting yep yeah i mean and you're thinking about a lot of these treatments are basically there's nothing uh highly technical about them right they're just, they're right. basically mechanical ways to prevent the acid from splashing up into the stomach you know? yeah yeah i love yeah exactly mechanical so, works for me Right. <laughs> That's right. There you go. The, and then we talked about it's very important to take a multivitamin, a high quality multivitamin to make sure that if you're on these acid blocking medications, whether natural or unnatural, synthetic or 
or natural that you take a multivitamin one that's very high in you know your b vitamins has you know a good amount of folate calcium zinc magnesium um, those things need to be taken they should be a, a good multivitamin should be taking you know, in my opinion, most, most days anyway, whether you're or not, you're on acid blocking medications. Um, Can and you then, tell me a, a little ahead. bit more about the, uh, <laughs> we were talking last week with Jade, how we forget things. What did you just say, Keone? <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking about the multi, <laughs> the, the, multi- the multivitamin and take, taking a multivitamin when you're uh-huh. on at, on these medications, whether they're natural oh, or not. Because, the B12. <laughs> yeah. B12 vitamin D, folate, calcium, zinc, magnesium, because, you know, if you're, if you're on these acid blocking medications, you're not going to absorb your nutrients well. So you, you want to kind of push the envelope by taking, taking like extra, extra vitamins and, you know, minerals to help with that. That's the whole thought. Because I remember you talking earlier about the B12. And so is it B12 is just not absorbed similar to all those things when you when you're on these acid blockers or is b12 neutralized when you i guess eat it or digest it by having this GERD problem so b12 is specific is a specific b vitamin that's very important when to to take extra when you're on any type of acid blocking medication the reason why is is because for b12 to be absorbed well um, you need to have stomach acid present it's a very specific vitamin and if over time you are on an acid blocking medication, um, you you can become anemic, okay. vitamin twelve uh, anemia, which can create all kinds of other problems mm-hmm. and symptoms. Um, stomach acid, you need stomach acid. What B twelve requires to be absorbed is something that's called intrinsic factor that's that's secreted from the the stomach and the uh, there's a certain type of cell in the stomach called the parietal cells that secrete the stomach acid and intrinsic factor. They have, they have to be go together to help you absorb your B12. Okay. Yeah. So B12 is very specific. So you, when you, a lot of times when you read about acid blocking medications, people, you know, on the back labels and stuff, they'll say, well, you know, you can become anemic and and it's usually a B vitamin anemia. But, but also you need it, you need it to help you absorb iron too. So, right, yeah. no, and no. iron is another for, type of anemia. Um, and, and, here, and then the big thing is, is, you know, as we get older, we kind of uh, lose our digestive fire. We've heard Jillian talk about this and our digestive fire is our capacity to digest well. And usually we have good reserves when we're younger, you know, we can, we shouldn't, but usually we can get away with you know, eating on the run. But as we get older, that's the, that digestive fire is, is really, you know, it, it, the reserves are not there. And you mm-hmm. really have to make sure that the lifestyle stuff is in order to help. And the main reason is, is if you, if you are not doing that, you're really opening up yourself to infections, not only infections, right. the GI, but, but outside of that too, because if you're not absorbing things well, you're not getting the nutrition that you want overall that depresses your immune system. So in theory, at least in theory, at least I haven't seen a correlation here, but I'm sure it's there is now if your your immune system is lower and you're older, you're more prone to get colds, flus, pneumonia. I mean, you name it. Yeah. You know? You're just racking it on at that point. It's yeah. It right. seems like a cascade. Right. Um, I, you know, and here's a very big thing. I, I, I know this is going to happen because, you know, people listen to this podcast and be like, oh, you know, screw these acid blocking medications. I'm not going to be on them, you know, because Dr. Keone said on this podcast, I shouldn't be on them. That's not what we're saying here because what I don't want to happen is I don't want people to have awful rebound, right? You all of a sudden you come off your medications and now you're getting like the symptoms really bad. So you is should that, never come off common? your what's that is that common a rebound with with these medications when you come off of them too fast absolutely it's very common where where you're like wow i i used to have reflux and i came off my medication now it's really bad you know and and so you really have to kind of think about weaning off of these things slowly but surely yeah to to help to help avoid that yeah and as we said before you know the goal is to come off of these meds if and when you can and and talk to your doctor about it you know i mean it, it's not something that you should ignore and it's not something that you should say oh well yeah i just treat it fine by 
you know, just taking my acid blocking medications. It's, it's something you really want to, to get control of. Yeah, absolutely. In a, in a, in a common sense way. Yeah. Yeah. That was so, great. Anything else, Keone? Well, let's see. I'm, I want to make sure I didn't take you off track with my B12 <laughs> forgetfulness in question. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, let's see. I think, I think that is everything I want to talk about here. I'm just looking through my, through my notes. So primarily I've only, I, you know, experienced, you know, people who have heartburn or GERD or anything like that. But when I, uh, you see the commercials all the time, like watching football and stuff like that for like Prilosec um, and these other medications, these acid blockers all the time watching football. So it must be a chicken wing and beer thing. <laughs> what is this about? Or stressing out about your team not winning, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like getting started. Oh, uh, so a couple of things in my in my notes that I just want to mention, and and then we can end. But so so we talked about one way to treat is to to make the stomach empty faster. Sometimes digestive enzymes can do that. There are medications out there that that are also that also can do that. They're called prokinetics. We didn't mention this. Um, the, the examples of prokinetics are Reglan. Um, uh, gosh, I forget. There, there's some other ones, but Reglan is the ma the main one. I think it's called metoclopramide or something that can help the stomach empty faster. We talked about baclofen, right? Um, talked there, about some some surgeries. Mm -hmm. uh, These are prokinetic medications, as one you mentioned. Yeah, this, and think about prokinetic, kinetic movement, right? Helping. Right things move along quickly. So there are medications that can help that happen. Interesting. Okay. Um, so that's one thing I want to bring up. And then also a couple other things I, I completely forgot about this is, is there are some studies on melatonin helping, right? Um, hmm. It may help treat, treat GERD symptoms. Melatonin is relatively safe. Um, and, you know, especially at low doses and it has few or any side effects, of course. So melatonin may help. Um, that's interesting. It, it, and it, it's, it, it is weird because it, it seems to help strengthen the LES for, for whatever reason. I'm not sure of the exact mechanism of how it does that. Um, another thing, and I do this all the time in my clinic is, uh, with acupuncture, acupuncture can, there are some, some decent studies that have shown that it can be, a, you know, somewhat effective at treating GERD. Um, especially with electroacupuncture, there are actually specific points on the body that can do help with that. Um, Where are they generally located throughout? Uh, generally, the, the, the main ones are located uh, uh, right, right down the center of your torso, right? In so the front? A, there's, in the front, yeah. So between your navel, the main points would be between your navel and the end of your sternum. Okay. And, uh, you know, we talked about reducing your stress. Well, meditation is a good one. And, oh, this is the other thing I want to mention, Brian. This is, if you know, that this is the thing that I, I tell my patients. And this is important, very important. It could save your life. So, so a lot of symptoms of reflux can mimic and vice versa. Symptoms of heart attack can mimic uh, acid, you know, acid reflux. If you're not sure what's going on there, right? What yeah. should you do before going and getting help or going to the ER or whatever? What should you do if you're not sure? The very first thing you can do to, to help save your life is pop an aspirin under your tongue so that it gets into your body. So it'll get into those veins under the tongue if, if you think there may be any chance that you're having a heart attack. And it, it's probably reflux but you should pop an aspirin and that could save your life if you're having a heart attack and then you get to the emergency room. Wow. All right. I bring that up because I've had some patients over the years who thought their reflux was just reflux, but it actually was a heart attack. So though there's some, wow, there, there's some, you know, overlapping Very symptoms different. there that I just tell people. So if, when, if ever you think, or if you're at risk or you have cardiovascular risk factors or it runs in your family, I mean, just having some aspirin around, baby aspirin around is very, very helpful and may save your life if that's what's going on. Wow. All right. 
Um, what else? I'm glad you asked me that because now I'm having all these, all kinds of things come back to me. What are other things? You, you wouldn't have like neurological symptoms with the GERD where you would possibly like arm, not necessarily neurological, but your arm going numb or heavy, like you would have with a heart attack. You, you know what? I, I would say uh, this, it's interesting, Brian. I would say, yeah, t- you would think not, right? Mm-hmm. You would think not, but it's, it's, I just don't take chances with, <laughs> with yeah. that. Because Absolutely. it really can mimic, GERD can mimic a heart attack, you know, mm-hmm. and vice versa. I mean, I've seen the symptoms run the gamut on people. And, you know, so I, I you know, typically not, you're right. It's not, you know, you're going to feel like the, the, the burning sensation, like underneath your sternum and stuff like that, or in your, what we call your epigastric area. Um, and you may or may not have the stereotypical, you know, pain or numbness in the arm or you know the right arm typically i i just tell people if you think it may be a heart attack just be prepared you know yeah absolutely you know so anyway and and typically it's not typically it's not at all but it can save your life Mm -hmm. and then gerd can be caused because i've mentioned it earlier i said overactive but it can be caused by either an overactive or underactive LES is kind of what we got at. Because that's where I'm getting confused about the baclofen. Uh-huh. If it's treating a muscle spasm. So it's making it more relaxed, which initially seemed like that was the problem to me. The LES was so relaxed um, that acid's just pouring it. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's somewhat confusing, right? Um, I would think about it like this when you're talking about the baclofen. Think about a, a band of muscle, the lower LES, that is just not functioning optimally. And whereas a baclofen, let's say it's going in and out of spasm. This is the way I like to think about it. It's going in and out of spasm. Sometimes it's over tight. Sometimes it's under tight. And taking some baclofen will put it in that Goldilocks zone to where it's acting more appropriate, so to speak. Okay, perfect. So that's the way I would think about it. You okay, know? yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact mechanism, but from what I've read and understand, that's the way it may work. Okay. And I, and I, and baclofen really is secondary to some of these other medications. Right. Like it's not the first line of treatment from a, you're certainly, if you're going in to see your conventional doc, it's not the first thing you're going to prescribe or yeah, recommend. Yeah, it's generally for spinal cord injuries. <laughs> <laughs> so. about to, yeah, it's a, well, it's a muscle, yeah, <laughs> it's right. a muscle relaxer, right? It's a muscle relaxer that's typically, if you have an, a, a back spasm or something like that, that's typically where you're going to see back with them. So anyway. All right, any, what else, Brian? Is there anything else? Yeah, all right. So I just want to make sure I'm clear. It can be caused by overactive or underactive LES. Either way, we want it in that Goldilocks position. That's kind of what we're saying. Or is it can it not yeah. be caused by overactive or well, so so if your LES is is overact when you say overactive, it's tight. just too Let's tight it where tight. it's clenched down yeah. and nothing can get past it. No, you're not gonna have okay. reflux. You're you're not gonna feel the reflux, so to speak. What you're gonna feel though is when you eat. You're not going to be able to swallow appropriately because the LES is not opening up or you have a constriction there. But, you know, and you just brought up another point, like one of the side effects of having like um, one of the complications, I should say, of having too much acid in the esophagus is your esophagus can become very narrow, right, Mm -hmm. Um, where you get all the scarring. So now swallowing becomes an issue. And sometimes a, a, a uh, procedure or surgical procedures where they go down there and stretch the esophagus to uh, help prevent that. And sometimes in that stretching process, what happens is they, they completely uh, uh, cause dysfunction in the LES to where it won't tighten up anymore. So now you're, okay. now you really have to be on this, but yes, if you have an overactive LES, typically you're not going to have that splashing up if it's chronically tight. But when I hear overactive, I'm thinking overactive, meaning, well, sometimes it's overacting, but other times it's not, it's underactive. Right. And I think that's where the baclofen comes in. Yeah. Okay. You know? Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. So if that, if that clarifies it, that's the way I, I tend to think about it. Yeah, that clarifies it. All right. That's I it for that's, it. Uh, that's probably enough for people are probably having indigestion right now. All that information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right everybody thank you so much for joining us this week and we will talk to you next week all right take care everybody